Hey guys, this is so exciting because this is actually working now. This morning we tried to do Kinnis Live and the Wi-Fi wasn't having it. So here we are. Hopefully this will stay on and be awesome for at least a few minutes so we can get some of these questions answered. So what is this? This is Kinnis Live and hey what's up viewers so good to see you guys um, this is just an open forum each Friday to get your questions answered talk about life talk about all kinds of awesome stuff that's going on in the world and to get right down to it the first question that I have today I'm not gonna say this person's name because there's a lot of uh, personal information in here detailed information but I want to read this for you so this person says, Hi Mindy, I'm in sort of a dilemma, at least it feels that way. I am 33 years old and I want more. I feel like I've been putting off this quote more ever since I graduated high school. I'm at a point in my life that feels really confusing. It feels stagnant and mindlessly rote. Uh, I'm going to skip through some of this. There are times, brief moments, where I catch a glimpse that money is just money. These days, more often, I feel paralyzed and stuck. I don't feel my intuition calling, pulling me in the right direction. I just feel alone and unsure of what to do. I'm 33 years old. My parents pay my rent. Uh, I have X amount of credit card debt, and my parents pay that for me as well. I don't pay my car insurance. My parents pay for that too. I was in school for food science as an out-of-state student, but something happened with financial aid, and now I have to pay back $4,000 to, to get back into school. I just got hired at 7-Eleven making minimum wage. Currently I have $56,000 in student loans and if I continue with university, two plus years left, I'll probably come out with close to seventy dollars to $80,000 in debt for a two year degree. I'm not trying to play the victim here. I understand that this is my life and my problem to take care of. However, I don't know what to do. I don't feel good. I don't feel an inner voice anymore telling me to follow my passion. I feel stuck and worried that I'll never be able to own a home marry my girlfriend, save for retirement, travel, etc. cetera. Uh, so then this person goes on to look at some of the things that are going on and some of the options. Now, here's what I have to say. Hi, Mark Bruns. Um, to this person that sent in their question, first off, thank you. It's, it's always uh, an uncomfortable situation. It can, be, it can feel awkward to talk about money, but I had to learn this lesson as well is that unless you start talking about it and really looking at where you're at financially and what's going on with you and really being clear about the numbers nothing's going to change it's it's much easier to bury your head in the sand and not want to deal with it but that doesn't get you anywhere I know because I tried to do that now as far as let's talk first about education I love education I'm a lifetime student and I went all the way from you know, grade school all the way through my PhD, did two different master's programs, and I'm a little bit insane about school. So I'm right there with you. I also have student loan debt, and when I came out of one of the grad school, one of my master's programs, I was probably near $100,000 in debt. So I have been there, totally get that. What I want to say about that is that it does have to feel like it's going to be worth it though to you. If you don't feel the inspiration, the passion to at least continue on in that program, maybe it's not right for you and it's better to just kind of call it and then figure out the finances as opposed to going all the way through gaining more and more and more and more and more debt and then finally being able to say, oh well I finished but I don't even want this degree. So there's a lot to be said for that. And obviously without asking some more questions about this to this specific person, I can't say specifically. But what I would say is that if you're 33 years old, you need to, uh, how do I want to say this nicely, uh, grow up. <laughs> and I mean that with, with the best of intentions and the best um, way to look at that. But if your parents are currently paying for everything that you've got going on right now, you're essentially a child and at 33 there's no reason that you need to be doing that so here's a couple things that I have as a suggestion for you first and foremost is who are you hanging out with I'll tell you a little story because I think that you live in Portland and when I lived in Portland I hung out with 
other grad students. We were all writers, so we had that kind of starving artist mentality. And that was a, around the same time where I met my husband, my current husband, Sean. And I remember telling Sean one time, I was like, you know, nobody in Portland has any money. So I was building my coaching practice at the time, and my story was that, well, no one has any money, so no one can hire me for a good rate, etc. And it was because of who I was surrounding myself with. I was, like I said, in school and choosing to spend most of my, all of my time with other starving artist writers. So yes, the people that I knew didn't have any money. And I just remember Sean saying to me, Mindy, Brendan Burchard lives in Portland. So yes, people have money and there are entrepreneurs there. There are people that could hire you that you might love to work with there. So don't you know give me this whole like, nobody has any money in Portland story. And that was it, it was my story. So look at who you're surrounding yourself with, look at who your current peer group is. And my suggestion is to possibly up level who you're hanging out with. That doesn't mean you have to ditch all your friends or your family, of course not. But it does mean being very, very deliberate in terms of who are you spending your time with? Who are you learning from? Who are you engaging with? Who are you talking to? Because that totally impacts the amount of money that you can make. My second thought for you is that, you know, if you are working at 7-Eleven, for those of you who just joined us, I'm answering a very specific question from somebody who wrote in, and they're currently working at 7-Eleven making minimum wage. Now, that's not the best leverage of your time. That is fine for somebody who's maybe in high school or somebody who doesn't have other skills that, that they can be leveraging. But my guess is is that you're if you're already this far into your education, there's other things that you could be doing. And you know, yes, people, oh, but it's so hard to get a job even trying. Well, there are zillions of jobs out there. And I guarantee you that there's going to be one that's a better leverage of your time than working at 7-Eleven so that you can then make more money per hour so that you can begin to start paying your rent, start you know doing your stuff. Maybe it's about taking some time off so that you can get all of your finances in order and then figure out if that school route is going to be the best thing for you because maybe not. If you're not feeling that pull, that inspiration, that can happen, but that also happens when you're living in scarcity. It's really hard to be creative when you're just enmeshed in scarcity thinking. It's like the complete opposite. So to say, oh, well, I don't feel that inspiration, of course not. You're feeling scarcity, you're feeling fear, you're feeling all that crap that doesn't sound very good. Um, so that's my, my first two thoughts, is that one, up-level your peer group, to really look at how you're leveraging your time and if working at a minimum wage job is going to be worth it to you because my guess is there probably is something else that you can find to do this. So I'm going to answer some of these comments now, but many employers prefer bachelor degrees. Yeah, that's true, but many also do not. I mean, there are so many jobs out there. Anytime I hear, whether it's a client or just somebody I know talking about this whole job scene, you know, they act as if like, such it's such a victim mentality to me because <laughs> there are so many jobs out there and I will add this on to that uh, just because you guys are commenting about this is that I really don't care about what it says in a quote job description let me tell you my one of my first jobs in corporate America well I would say the first job that I had in corporate the requirements for that job were two things one that you had to have a bachelor degree in a science, so either biochemistry, something like that. And secondly, you had to have three to five years of experience within the industry. Now, I had none of those things. I had a bachelor's degree, but my bachelor's degree was in theology, which is, had nothing to do with science. And I certainly didn't have any experience at all in that industry because I was just out of college. Now, yes, those were the, quote, requirements. But I was able to say, look, here's what I can do for you. Here's what I can offer you as a company. And my, my guess is that most of you guys could do that too. So don't be afraid of the requirements or what somebody says, this is how it has to be. Be creative, figure it out, you know? Do figure out how you can get in there if that's a place you wanna get in. Uh, second question, and this is one that I wanna speak to. Somebody asked me this at HeartPath actually, and I think it's such a great, 
question since we're on the money topic today. Somebody said to me, you know, looking back to when you were starting your business and when you were in this great, huge struggle of financial chaos, what was something that you could have done differently to maybe not go into uh, the drama <laughs> that I went into? For those of you that don't know, that have maybe recently started following me, when I started my business, within two years, I was uh, I had foreclosed my house, my mortgage. I was evicted from my apartment. I was living in my office, and then after that, I ended up filing bankruptcy. So that sucked. <laughs> None of that was fun or good or anything. So a lot of people have said, you know, what what might you have done differently? Because they obviously don't want to get into that same situation that I put myself into. And one of the things that I mentioned to this person and that I want to add to this conversation is that one of the things I could have done but I did not do was really know the numbers. And I mentioned this earlier, it, it can be uncomfortable, it can be an awkward situation to figure out what your numbers are, but that really is the, the first and easiest step that you can take to know what is your burn rate you know how much money does it take for you to live whatever your nut is per month how much money is that what's the exact number and also for those of you entrepreneurs out there what's your fume date you know how much money do you have that if you are not able to consistently move forward and be gathering income each month What's your fume date in terms of how long do you have until you are going to run out of money? Now, I could have done a lot of different things. I could have gone to go back and get a job, which I didn't ever do. Um, it would have saved me probably a lot of hassle, but uh, that, that wasn't on the path for me. So that's one option. But even today, you know, I noticed that I had been kind of increasing my monthly nut over the last few months, just signing up for random things like... Oh, I, I have to upgrade my SoundCloud account, you know, for my podcast or little things like that. And maybe it's six dollars here per month, or ten dollars per month, or twenty dollars per month, or all of these little things. And one of the things that I did recently was to really look at my numbers and say, okay, what is it that I actually need versus what is just this superfluous stuff. So just by doing that looking at even things that I had signed up for maybe a few months ago that I was using with certain groups and I am now not using, I was able to save myself over $100 every month just by canceling some of these uh, subscription type payments that I wasn't even using these things. So that's a really, really important point is just to know what your numbers are, know what your monthly nut is, you know, know what this date is that's a fume date to be able to say, okay, I have you know eight months to get this business going, and if I don't within that time frame, I'm going to have to do something else. And here's what that something else might be. So, thank you guys so much. I want to touch base with some of you guys that have been commenting here. Um, hello to Mark. Hello to Monty. Hello to Suzanne. Hello to Tom. Dana. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to be on here now that this Wi-Fi is actually working. Um, that's another thing to keep in mind is that when you have something planned and then it doesn't go uh, according to how you're expecting it to go, like when I say, oh, I'm going to do a new live stream show at 10 a.m. on Friday mornings, and then I get on there and the Wi-Fi is totally haywire and completely crazy. You know, what do you do? I've, I've learned that it doesn't help to get frustrated or annoyed or mad about that, but just roll with it and say, okay, cool, you know, I'll check it out later and see what happens. So if you guys have other questions for me, I'm happy to answer them and we'll see what types of conversation come up. Thank you guys so much for being there. Uh, Monty, I heard that the America is the land of opportunity. <laughs> it depends who you ask. <laughs> That's not always true. I think that in some areas around the world, it appears that way or it seems that way in contrast, but that's not always the case. Um, depending on your situation, it, it could be very different as it was for me. But that being said, 
I also, you know, have come to a place now where I can make a lot more money than I ever thought that I could. So it's it's completely what, you know, what do you do with it? There is opportunity for that to learn and to grow and to develop into somebody that you actually want to become, the entrepreneur that you want to become. So we, Sean and I, are getting ready this evening to go to dinner with one of our dear, dear friends, one of our favorite people on the planet, a uh, great business mentor to us both, Brian Kurtz. Brian was in charge of, I think he was a VP or something like that at Boardroom for many, many, many years and has recently just gone on to become an entrepreneur. So I'm super excited to chat with him and hear how that's all going. He puts together this uh, Titans of Direct Response program. Anyway, what's cool about living in Scottsdale, as we do, and uh, the Phoenix area is that there are a lot of conferences here, so lots of cool people come through this area all the time. So Sean and I don't often have to go anywhere to see them. These people come to us, and when they're in town, we grab dinner with them. So that's really, really fun. Okay, let's get to some more questions here. What is a good way to draw interest in what you are selling? That's Dana. Dana, that's marketing. I, I would suggest studying as much marketing as you possibly can. I didn't do that that was my mistake early on and it would have helped a lot <laughs> to learn more about marketing I've recently met people who say that they study uh, marketing for up to two hours a day and they've been doing that for years and years and I used to think about marketing as something that was slick and salesy and I didn't really want anything to do with it what I didn't realize though is that if I didn't want to do marketing I ultimately didn't want to do business I thought I could separate those two out but that's simply not the case. Um, Jen, I'm a counselor who would love to start my own business. Yes, I love entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. Yay. How should I start? <laughs> well, that's, that's a big question. Um, there's the technical side of it, which is starting as either a sole proprietorship or an LLC. Uh, I would highly recommend LLC because what that does is that separates you yourself from the legal business entity and that just gives you a little more legal protection it's not that you are your business but there's actually a corporate veil in between the two so that's just better in terms of uh, the legalities and beyond that you know get a website start talking it up start putting it together um, I I'm not going to go into everything that you need to do because that's a huge answer but I would totally say go for it it's awesome uh, if you're interested, that's one of the things that we go through a lot in my core coach training program because everybody in there is looking to start a business. So one of the whole huge segments is what do I do? Where do I start? How do we even begin? So awesome question, Jen. I wish you awesome blessings with that. That's exciting. Uh, okay. What happens when you lose a lot of weight, like 220 pounds, and then you still are not happy and get deepest and fall back into gaining your weight back well yes that happens quite frequently and I'll tell you why there's a principle called psycho cybernetics where your mind is set up to have a set point kind of like a thermostat you may have heard this before but it's a very very basic illustration and it's exactly what's happening when people lose a lot of weight and then they gain the weight back because if your set point is set to I am the fat person or I am you know X number of pounds that becomes your comfort zone and then when you get out of your comfort zone you've lost the weight congratulations but your mind is like blah, holy crap we need to get back into our comfort zone and it's called the snapback effect it brings you right back to your set point and oftentimes with weight it actually brings you a little higher <laughs> there's a few extra just in case and what that is is your brain attempting to protect itself. It thinks that, holy crap, we are outside of our comfort zone. This is really, really scary and it's dangerous. Now, granted, you can look at this and say logically, you know that it's not dangerous. It's actually healthier, you know, all these things. But your brain doesn't know that. The amygdala part of your brain is freaking out and that, uh, that's what causes that snapback effect. So what you need to do is change your set point and how you can do that, one of the best ways to do that is through repetition. So repeating, watching video, watching uh, 
are doing affirmations that are all about changing that set point. So wish you luck with that. That's a great, great question. Thank you, Christian. Um, Suzanne, what do you do to inspire yourself? I'm looking over here because there's some door opening over there. I'm just seeing what's going on. Uh, what do I do to inspire myself? I get in nature. That, to me, is one of the most inspiring and uh, recharging places that, that I can be. So I might go for a hike or, depending on how much time I have or, or where I am, go for a walk. But being in nature, to me, is hugely rejuvenating. So that would be my, my top choice. Thanks for that question, Suzanne. Okay, of course, Dana, you're welcome. Is what you do life coaching? This is from Piero. What type of counseling do you do? So most of the coaching that I do is not necessarily life coaching, but uh, working with entrepreneurs who are looking to start businesses. Most of them are wanting to be coaches, so that, that is probably the majority of what I do is helping people start up coaching practices. Um, it could be a sort of a counseling practice too. It's not necessarily just about coaching, but that would be the majority of who I work with. The other kind of part of what I do is called Heart Path. Heart Path is a retreat that I run every year. And what that's really about is helping people figure out what it, what's their purpose. You know, what in the heck are they here to do? And granted, a lot of would-be entrepreneurs kind of show up for that as well because that's who I attract. That's the type of energy that I put out, that entrepreneurs are awesome, that you can go out and start your own business, that you can, you know, make great money doing whatever it is that you would like to do. And I love, love, love helping them sort that out, helping them get clear about what it is and then the steps to take in terms of how to make that dream a reality. Because to me, it was all just starting as a dream. You know, I was, you may or may not have heard my story, but I was living in Kenya, in Africa, and just thinking, you know, what, what is it that I'd like to do? Because I don't want to work in corporate America for my whole life. So what does that look like, and what does it include? And it turns into something like Heart Path, where I can combine my love of the wilderness with my love of doing transformative work with my love of helping people figure out, you know, what are their passions, what's their purpose, and then helping them figure out how to put that into a context like becoming an entrepreneur or something like that. So a lot of what I do is not life coaching per se, but entrepreneur coaching? I don't know, whatever you want to call that. Um, Jen, thanks, I need to save up some extra money first. That's my struggle. Yes, you and almost everybody, but there are lots of ways that you can start without having to save up a ton of money. So just remember that. Um, Monty, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, astrological business offering future predictions and horoscope to people. Can anyone make a living by this? Yeah, that people make a living by that. Uh, there are some people that do quite well. There are a lot of people that don't. I will tell you this. I'm not, you know, just looking at the sunshine of this. There are some people that struggle with that. But, uh, yeah, Troy, what do we get if you get to 100 viewers a dance party? Um, no. <laughs> you get a dance party with Sean, but no, I don't. Uh, Sean, get off of my feed. <laughs> This is what Sean says. This is my husband commenting. What's the best part about being married to that stud, Sean Stevenson? Well, since you're kind enough to ask about this, I will answer that. My favorite part about being married to Sean is laughing. I am, I tend to be a much more serious person. He's, he's a total, complete goofball, and that's a really good combination in our marriage. Um, I laugh every single day, mostly at his expense, but <laughs> often with him too. And we just have a really good time. So that is, uh, that's, that's my favorite part. Piero, of course, you're welcome. Ha ha, Sean, that's so funny. <laughs> He's literally in the next room, right over there, commenting on this. <laughs> So I want to thank you guys for <laughs> watching. <laughs> um, Melissa, how did you two meet? We actually met on Facebook. 
the quick story is that I had I was living in Portland, Oregon at the time, and Sean was in Chicago, and I had just contributed to a book that had just recently come out, and one of my buddies in Portland had been helping me do some promotion for the book, and he was connecting me with all these people and had sent me a bunch of friend requests on Facebook. One of them happened to be Sean, and there was maybe five or six that day, so I just clicked everybody and said, great, you know, yay, we're all friends. Didn't really think much of it until about six months after that, and I was in Chicago, which is, I'm from there originally, and so I was visiting my family, and I was also attending a conference there, and the speaker on stage was talking about his buddy, who is three feet tall and in a wheelchair, but was, you know, living large and living the dream, going all over the world. And I thought, you know, I think I'm Facebook friends with that guy. I should look him up, the guy that this man's talking about. So that evening, I look up Sean, and I was like, yeah, we're Facebook friends. That's cool. Uh, I see we're both from Chicago. We're both about the same age. And I should, I should say hello. Now, I'm thinking business, you know, networking, connection. And so I write to him, and I'm like, hey, this guy gave you a great shout-out today. That was cool. I'm also from Chicago, you know, in the same industry if you ever want to grab coffee. And like I said, I was thinking business, but Sean says, well, I would never say no to coffee and a cute girl. And I was like, well, that's not at all what I meant, but uh, next time I'm in town, you know, maybe I'll give you a call. So fast forward six months even after that, so probably a year from that initial uh, connection point. We, we did have coffee. We did end up on a date, and that was, that was how it started. Thank you, Abel. Very kind of you. You guys are inspiring. Been an athlete all my life. This is Steven. What advice can you give to someone having to start over at 40? Well, I would say start over what? Start over not as not an athlete anymore. Um, here's the thing is that when we define ourselves as one thing at any point in our lives, this can be no matter how old you are or young you are, when we're defining ourselves as one thing, that's, that's kind of a dangerous place to be because then if you are injured or something happens that you're not able to continue being that one thing, maybe you get fired from a job or whatever it is, then it's like, oh, crap, you know, what, what now? People, I've seen people in relationships do this too where they – completely give themselves to their husband or their wife and then maybe a divorce happens or maybe one of the one of them dies and then it's like uh you know I need to start over now and first off 40 is super young so let's be clear about that like you have plenty of time but what I would tell you in terms of the mindset is to go with this let's see if you can see that infinity the reason that I have an infinity on my wrist as does Sean is that that's the only way that you can truly define yourself is that you are infinite you are a man or a woman you might be a husband you might be a mother you might be a, you know corporate executive you might be a teacher you might be a yoga instructor you know all of these different things but the truth is that you are infinite so how do you start over I would say figure out what you want to do next because you have this infinite capacity of things that you could do or could pursue Figure out what you would, what sounds good, uh, what, how you could leverage your time, and how you can make some money doing that, and go from there. I mean, that's super fun, and I love when people have to quote start over, because I'm like, cool. Then all that crap from your past is done, and you can like have this full spectrum of infinite opportunities and infinite potential. So there's that. That's really exciting. Uh, let's see. Go back up here, Melissa. Of course. Thank you. Um, what kind of marketing do you think works best? Jen, that really depends on your target audience. So I'd love to know more about what you're thinking. Um, Dana, one of my goals is to learn to laugh at myself like Sean does. Do you do this as well? <laughs> I am my worst boss, LOL. Yeah, me too. No, like I was saying earlier is that I'm much more serious than Sean is. Yes, Tyler, he is the man. Uh, so I... And, and, you know, quite honestly, Sean does laugh at himself, but there are also times where both of us are like, you know, just frustrated. And I tend to get more irritated or more angry. Sean tends to get more sad and emo. So we kind of have this, like, balancing act. Most of the time we're not down on the same day, 
those days are really not so fun and that thankfully they don't happen very often that we're both down usually one of us is like come on let's go <laughs> you know get yourself together but uh, so that helps and we do have a kind of a different way of looking at that too so it's it's nice to have that balance um, thank you. oh thank you Steven that's awesome <laughs> thank you guys that's great good 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 stuff well I wanted to keep this at about 30 minutes and we are just over that now. As I mentioned, Sean and I are getting ready to go to dinner with one of our dear friends, Brian Kurtz. And um, Jen, yes, marketing for clients for sure. It depends what kind of clients you're looking for though. Like who is, who is your avatar? Then that probably would be the best place to start is develop an avatar. If you don't know what I mean by that, look that up online, like business avatar avatar or marketing avatar because defining that who that client is I mean one specific person is going to be the key to what you know type of marketing is going to work best for that one person so you guys thank you so much again I apologize that this is way later than I intended it to be it was supposed to be Friday morning but we'll try it again next week and uh, <laughs> lots of love to all of you guys have a great night and a great weekend look forward to seeing you all soon on my next live stream and as of uh, next Tuesday check out threefootchef.com that's what we've been working on a lot over here and I uh, look forward to seeing you guys soon thanks so much good night